So the starting the setup is that uh, m is some symplectic manifold, and I want to make no assumption on this except that the fact that it's closed. And L inside of M is a closed Lagrange. And then what we're supposed to do is consider um, consider the cohomology of L. Okay. Or more correctly, the cochains on L. As an algebra with the cup product. <coughs> so that's our starting point. And then Fleur theory gives rise to a deformation. of this algebra structure. Uh, which gets called Fleur cohomology of L. And because it turns out you could do in this in pairs, you could FLL. And again, more correctly, you should do this at the chain level. And and then there are some technicalities, which are, for example, the fact that the cochains, they form a differential graded algebra. But if you try to set this up, it doesn't work out very nicely as a differential graded algebra. This turns out to be an A-infinity algebra. But that's not, that's not the primary, primary concern. The but but that, that's, that's what it means. That, that's, that's what it means that it's a deformation. Um, OK, so what's the main problem? So the main problem is that when you set up this deformation, you don't actually get an algebra that um, the, the, the first, the zeroth order part of the deformation. So this is kind of problem one. There's two problems of the deformation is given by a class M0 inside of HF star. Uh, let me just say H upper star, which is an obstruction. This is an obstruction to, as Oktav says, to the deformed differential to M1 as a map from the cohomology to itself. Uh, giving rise to a differential. Okay. Just to be a little bit clear about what I'm writing, what I'm trying to say is that you know this this framework where you know you really can work all can, you can just work with the cohomology of L as long as you remember that the cohomology of L is some kind of infinity algebra, and then you can think of the Fleur cohomology as if it's defined as the cohomology of the cohomology of L equipped with some new differential called M1. Okay, so that's, that's what's happening here. Okay, what does it mean that it's an obstruction? It means that you know, if I take M1 squared of some element x, it's not, it should be 0, but it's not. And it ends up being the commutator. Uh, let me not even use the word M2. It ends up being the commutator uh, of x with, with, something, with the element M0. And this is the first problem. And the second problem is that it is very difficult to understand how um, these deformations behave in families. And the correct version of families here is not Hamiltonian families, because if you have a Hamiltonian isotopy, then the deformation is essentially you know, is independent, locally constant. Deformation is locally constant, but rather in non-Hamiltonian families. 
and I, I don't think I, I may say something at the end of, uh, about this problem. But to me, these are the two essential problems. Okay. So uh, what this talk is about is a proposal which is to replace um, this cohomology of L by uh, another algebra. And uh, the correct thing, let me just let me use some language, by the Kozul dual algebra, which is the homology of the base loop space. Okay? And this is somehow proposal like you know, this is th this is version zero, this is version zero point five, and then if towards the end I will maybe say something about what I believe to be an even better um, story that one can tell, but but let's just talk about this. Okay. So uh, so let me just recall. So what is this thing here? So given given the base point star in L, <coughs> um, the we can consider omega L, which is the space of base loops. S1, comma 1 goes to L star. And this is well known from algebraic topology to be what is called an H space. In fact, it's better than an H space. It's, in fact, an A infinity space. It has that the uh, concatenation of loops concatenation defines a homotopy associative product. So that, that's what it means to be an H space. The fact that it's an A infinity space means that not only is it homotopy associative, but we have the full data of higher coherences of the homotopies between the, oops, uh, between the uh, different competitions. So whenever you have such a space, you can then pass to homology or chains in particular chains on L form an A infinity algebra. But again, if you do it, if you just work a little bit carefully, you can actually make it into a differential graded algebra with a bit of work. Good choices. Okay. Uh, sorry, chains of loop space on that. And then what I wrote there is just a homology. And roughly speaking, almost every time I write homology and I make some statement about homology being an algebra, I really mean you should either look at the chain level or what we really normally do is there's a notion of transfer, which kind of transfers any structure at the chain level to a structure of homology. So um, great. So the, the so now I claim that there is this. So let me just make be explicit. So the claim is um, Fleur theory gives rise to an A infinity deformation of the chains on the base space. Okay. So just some kind of remark. I mean, this is not the first time that uh, that you know people have tried to relate loops on uh, on Lagrangian to some kind of Fleur theoretic construction. There was, I think, probably the first time that I saw anything that looked like this. Uh, I was a graduate student, so it feels like it was more than a decade ago. Uh, so uh, I heard a talk by Lalonde, Francois Lalonde, describing joint work with Cornea. Uh, and I don't know what to call this. Maybe I should call this like pre-clusters <sighs> or pre-cluster homology. You know what I mean? The version of cluster homology that never made it into a paper. <laughs> so because it never made it to a paper. <laughs> so anyway, so I think you can actually find Francois's slides on MSRI and MSRI's web page. So, so. 
Yes, yes. Yeah. yes. Yeah. But yes, uh, MSRI uh, talk. And some long time ago. Uh, and then, um, yeah, so you see there, there's, a, there's a Burrow Cornea work. Uh, there's also yet another unreleased, this is actually a paper. There's another unreleased thing, which is some work of Oansha. Uh, I'll comment about, well, if I Also, I have to say the same time this is about uh, the work with the Baro, uh, it was this thing of Kukai. Yeah, 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 I'll, I'll comment. That, that was going to be the end. Um, uh, you, you, but you, you, yes, that, I'll, there's a specific place where that shows up. So there's a work of Oansha, um, which is at some kind of string math a couple years ago. String math at Stony Brook. Um, and he, he was really thinking about quantum cohomology, but it, it fits within this framework if you put it. And then finally, let me not mention Kenji's work. I'll come to it in a second. So, um, okay, so when you have a um, framework like this, then it's good to understand you know, what, do, what controls, so the key questions is what controls the A infinity deformations of this algebra? And the answer is fairly simple. It is the homology of the free loop space of L. Okay? So what does that mean? That means that, uh, so you know, if you want to use fancy machinery, what it says is that the deformation theory of an algebra is controlled by its Hochschild cohomology. And the Hochschild cohomology of the chains in the free loop space of L Algebra itself. This is Hochschild cohomology. Uh, is isomorphic to the homology of the free loop space. But actually, this isomorphism is just a not, not just an isomorphism of vector spaces. But this thing here has um, an, an. Let me now write just L infinity. Even though this is not what I want to do, I really would like to say E two. But let me just say L infinity. L infinity structure. Uh, coming from string topology. i.e. Chess and Sullivan. It's a small part of this of the theory that Chess and Sullivan studied. And this has, well, an L infinity structure really coming from homological algebra. But roughly speaking, there is some kind of formalism that says whenever you see a deformation problem, that deformation is controlled by an L infinity algebra, and that's and that's what I mean. So, uh, but it goes 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 back to Gersten Haber. Going back to Gersten Haber. Okay, so I wrote this, and then you could ask, is this a theorem? Okay, uh, and and the answer is no, and the answer is no because we we don't yet there is no. Convenient model for the chain level theory that would give rise to the L infinity structure on this. If you just want an L infinity structure is like a Lie, an infinity version of a Lie algebra. So if you just want the bracket, there's no problem defining the bracket here. But the higher products, you need some machinery to, to, to handle it. Um, so um, it's hard to get good models. Good models for this L infinity structure. But somehow there is no doubt that somehow if you if you were to manage to define anything meaningful geometric on this side, it would it would agree with this. It would you know agree with what you get on the other side. Okay, so now um, let me simplify and uh, kind of my notation. Simplify so note. For yes. Yes, that would be it would be meaningful enough, and then you have to do this comparison, and then this would be the kind of work that, you know, the kind of results that I proved, and then Shil Ganatra proved along the lines of like symplectic cohomology. You know, if you have some kind of generation statement, then symplectic cohomology is like the Hochschild cohomology of the Radfukai category, and then you could pass via that and to prove this kind of statement. Absolutely, you could do that. Uh, so simplify notation by uh, working not with some kind of L infinity structure. But with differential graded with D G B algebras instead of of L infinity. 
And this is, this is just a matter of choosing the right cochain model. OK, so, if, so what, with this simplification of notation, I can at least say what is required when you, what do I mean by something controls an A infinity, the A infinity deformations of this? So that basically says that the A infinity deformation of uh, the chains on the base lip space are in bijective correspondence, well, up to equivalence, are in bijective correspondence with uh, solutions to the equation uh, boundary of let me let me write curly m equals bracket of m with m. Okay, so this is where m is some element in this homology of the free loop space. Modulo what is called gauge transformation. Okay, so great. So again, if you if you replace if you replace homology of L by Hochschild cohomology, this is essentially, I mean, I'm not saying it's a definition, but it, it's, it's, you know, it's a, this is the output of deformation theory for A infinity algebras. Deformations up to equivalence are given by that. Um, and of course, but you, we must keep in mind the fact that our deformations always allow, always allow for this M0 term. So I'll come back to that in a second, for that M0. So key point, remark, we allow M0. Great. So now, this observation, this was used by Fukaya um, to, you know, I mean, essentially, uh, let me say to propose, because in the end it turned out that the that he never implemented the, the, the technical difficulties in, in ensuring that you have these equivalences, to propose a, a method for, um, well, propose, let me just say, obstructions for the existence of Lagrangian embeddings inside C3. C3 using properties of the free loop space of L for L three manifold. Okay? And somehow some kind of sample result says that if L is prime and admits such an embedding, is the prime three manifold. With such an embedding then L is S1 times sigma. Or this is a Riemann surface. OK, but that really used, I mean, you, I mean pr once, you, once, you, once you have a statement like this, you could try to then step back and remove all the references to the free loop space from it. And as I'm saying here, you know, not even not, not do any geometry here. Just construct this A infinity deformation, and then uh, and then you know every single time you need it, use you know just prove this at the level of homology and try to prove the corresponding that the corresponding L infinity structure behaves as expected. But but it really would be better if we can if we can uh, make these uh, geometric statements. Okay. Can what? See, the problem is that if you take, so any, any Lagrangian, any three manifold is going to, do, to, admit, um, to admit an immersion. And then you could do surgery at the, at the intersection point. So somehow, if L is sufficiently complicated, you know. So I don't exactly, we don't, there's no clean statement. I don't know clean statement in the non prime case. But. I think that's very Oh, OK. Uh, yes. Yes, because they can, they can, they say basically, say you only need one. You need the minimal amount of self intersections. You're right. Um, you're right. But the, the, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. But somehow there should still be some notion of. But anyway, yes. The things there should still be the ones that you didn't need to do that construction to obtain. If that makes any sense. 
I mean, it may not make sense mathematically, but, but my feeling is that that construction uses some kind of H principle. Yeah. And, and, and they should, that should have some different Fleur theoretic properties than the one which are obtained not using an H principle. <laughs> but, but anyway. Um, OK. So what I want to explain is, so I want to kind of explain some basic ideas about uh, the nature of uh, this deformation of the chains in the base loop space. Okay, and uh, and somehow you know now once once you want to describe some deformation, it really is really important to figure out which model of chains Okay, but I don't want to specify it. Okay, so I will be drawing some pictures, and then in order to make these pictures precise. You will have to make a you have to make a choice for model, and once you make this choice for model, then most likely these pictures don't actually reflect what's happening in your algebra. They reflect what's happening in the algebra up to some change of change of coordinates. But anyway, so the key point is that, uh, as I said, our deformations they start with m zero, so we should figure out what m zero is. So m zero is given as follows. So you consider consider the moduli space. of disks, <coughs> so m1. So I'm going to just put some notation. L, m, l, star. So what does that mean? These are, oh, see, th these are disks which map interior maps to m, the boundary maps to l, OK? And then they pass through the marked point, so passing through the marked point. OK. And then you can, of course, almost by definition. So, no, no, so I'm, I'm, I'm not, I, I could use this equivalence and describe something on the free loop space. But I think it's better for me to try to, to give some idea for what this for deformation is directly. So this evaluates to the, to the, to the base loop space itself. And so. Given a fundamental class for the moduli space, given a fundamental class fundamental chain for the moduli space, we get um, class. Of M1, and I'm I'm intentionally. If you may notice at this stage that I'm going to pass to homology, but I want to do this, and this is passage to homology is actually justified by some, like some kind of general remark that there's some way of transferring data from chains to homology. But let's just let me keep it hidden. Uh, but but anyway, you get some class in here, and this class is M0. So another way to say this is M0 measures disks passing through a fixed point, to, to, to a mark, to a base point. So these are homology? Yes. Thank you. Just, just one second. So that's M0. OK? Uh, let, me, let me remark on something. Kind of this, this, I found this quite shocking. When I uh, when I first noticed this, so corollary, say that L is acyclic, aspherical, i.e. L is a k pi one, which implies, by the way. That um, that h zero of L is just a group ring, uh, h star of L, which implies that h star L is the group ring. Then L, well, in this new sense, so the way to to for me to keep track of this new sense is to write this. 
So omega L is unobstructed, or rather is obstructed, if and only if the count of holomorphic disks uh, of Maslow 2 holomorphic disks passing through a point is non-zero for some for some homotopy class class in pi 1 okay so obstruction being obstructed is the same as m0 non0 because in this setting you're counting disks passing through a point and the only receptacle that the and the, you're counting them and, and considering the corresponding class in the homology of the loop space in the aspherical case the homology of the loop space is concentrated in one degree, which is degree zero. Okay? And then you try to figure out what is this count doing. And any disks of any disk of index disks of index less than two, in fact less than one, um, don't actually interact, you know, don't generically pass through a base point. Don't. Of course, then you have to figure out how to prove that they wouldn't, but pass through a uh, base point. Yes, even if they did, they would contribute homologically trivially. The homology of the loop space of a k pi 1. Yeah? What does it mean to be k pi 1? It means. Okay. It means that your loop space is actually the group. So that's all you have is this discrete. So um, yes, this, okay, this of index less than one don't pass through a point, so that's not an issue. And those of index index uh, bigger than uh, bigger than two, I guess this is less than two. <laughs> those of index bigger than two, well, they would a priori contribute to the higher dimensional homology of the loop space, which is zero. Okay, so I will come back to this because, um, I mean, hopefully, I have no idea what time it is. Okay, half an hour. I will hopefully come back to this because the case of L of Taurus is particularly interesting. And in that case, you can basically give a complete characterization of when there is any kind of, any object, any Fleur theoretic object supported on this torus that is non-trivial. But uh, let me come back later. Uh, So the next remark Okay, so that, that was the first part. Now what is M1? Uh, yes. You have you can take this M1 the moduli space. Yes. And you have a fundamental class to assume that there is no boundary. Yeah, yeah, of course, of course. Yes, which of course, then you, then you don't actually get a class here. You get a class in, in the chains, right? Uh, well, if there is a boundary, uh, you just get a chain. You get a chain, yeah, exactly. And the point is that the theory of homological, the, the theory of homological transfer of A infinity structures from homology to chains allows you to produce a class in here. Even if, even if it's boundary. not closed. Even if it's not closed. Yes, because you know, you, because it comes with a solution with a full with an a infinity deformation the fact that it comes from an a infinity deformation tells you you can do this but i didn't explain that but i agree that that is a point um okay so so what about m1 that's the place where i'm using a heavy a heavy machine of homological algebra to avoid okay Yes. Okay. So what about M1? So, so the so M1 is defined. So let me just informally say M1 is defined by string bracket with with the moduli space. Okay. 
but now where I don't impose passing through this base point. So let me explain a little bit what that means. So the, the basic idea is let's start with some, some family of loops. This is alpha, family of base loops. Of some, of some dimension. So then since it's of some dimension, it can kind of, it's traveling around. And then what I want to do is I want to take this family and I want to see where it, this family does it run through the boundary of a holomorphic disk. This is M1 of ML. And it's allowed to run through it at any point in here. I mean, any point along the boundary. And when it does, so let, I'm sorry, I should have oriented my family of loops. And my boundary of my holomorphic disk is also oriented. So when I do that, I can just concatenate the two. So take intersection then concatenate. Okay. So at the level of pictures, that is what we're doing. And that should define, so uh, somehow, this you can just try to define directly, but here you need some, some machinery to define this. So this, now I'm just say, should yield a map M1 from the uh, chains of the base loop space to the chains on the base loop space. Okay. And it, it doesn't, I mean, I, I, sh I could put a degree here, but there's no meaningful degree to put because the degree depends on the dimension of this moduli space, which depends on its Maslow index. So this will be kind of, this is not homogeneous, but the degree, no, component, like this, component of degree, um, of degree, um, n are given by, uh, I think this is n plus 1, by Maslow n uh, the minus, uh, what do I say, n minus 2. That's, that looks right to me. OK? So th this is going to have things of several degree, but that the degree will there'll be con contributions from moduli spaces of disk to different mass loss index. And now uh, you know somehow this isn't this hasn't been defined precisely, but but what now I come come to something which I I'm going to state as a conjecture in the sense that I believe that if things work out, if you can make these pictures into uh, into a um, into an actual construction without doing something which is not natural, so conjecture. There exists a model for this A infinity deformation, so for the chains on L, the chains on loop L, so that all higher MK vanish. Okay. Or more precisely, that M2 uh, is the usual product, or maybe more precisely, is that they are given more precisely. I would like to say that they are given by the classical expressions. Classical uh, higher product. So for example, if you in the usual story, when you look at M2, you, M2 is something like, you know, you, you take a cycle, you intersect it with the boundary of a disk, and you take another cycle and you intersect it with the boundary of disk, and then you evaluate at the third point. But I'm saying that there is no, in, in this story, there's no pictures that correspond to that. All there is is this M0 that I already described right here, and this M1, which is the string bracket, and that's all. And you can basically, you can kind of, if you draw some pictures, you can convince yourself that you know, this satisfies the desired equation with respect to the usual uh, concatenation of loops that you don't need to add an additional terms, an additional term in order for that to work out. Okay, so let me observe now a corollary of this. So if L is an oriented 
Orient I mean, orientable uh, k pi 1, then L is unobstructed. So unobstructed means m0 equals 0. Okay. L unobstructed, i.e. m0 equals 0. And I already explained what is needed for it to be unobstructed implies L is non-displaceable. OK, so usually, in order for you to go from unobstructed to non-displaceable, you have to go via Fleur cohomology is non-zero. And that's what we're doing here. Okay. So the claim is that if you're unobstructed, then the Fleur cohomology is non-zero. What's the proof? In the orientable case, this differential actually has odd degree. Okay? But the homology is supported in degree 0. So a differential in odd degree cannot change the homology. I mean, uh, uh, cannot change the homology if the homology is supported in degree 0. So um, this, is a, this, is a, this, is, I, this is a version of the Oden conjecture. So that conjecture is about uh, Lagrangian tori needing to bound Maslov 2 disks. And, uh, and this basically says that if they don't bound Maslov 2 disks, then uh, they, will, they, will, they will, I mean, they will necessarily be non displaced. OK, so. So uh, yeah, the, well, the claim is that yeah, th this this quantity is uh, this. So the claim is that you get. Yeah, there is some delicate question here. So, um, so I said fix a point, and then this m zero is an element of h zero of omega l. Then you could ask me what happens if you move that point. Okay, and the answer is. The corresponding class doesn't change in Fleur homology, not in the homology of the base loop space. So more correctly. Uh, what that means is that if you take two points, then there will be some isomorphism between the space of base loops at those two points, which is not necessarily the isomorphism given by connecting them by a path. It's that plus higher order terms. And under that isomorphism, the two, the two um, function, well, sorry, I keep, I'm going to say something soon where I'm going to talk, start talking about functions. But anyway, the two elements of the, of the, of the, two, element, the two M0s match up. But, but it's not the classical one, which is maybe one of the confusing points about this, this or that question. Yeah. It's not the yeah. In usual, yeah. Yeah, when you try to count. And this is some kind of wall crossing formula, is, is how to think about this. OK, so um, uh, next thing that I want to talk about is let's talk about tori. Now, just let's specialize, because the, the story here is particularly nice case where L is a torus. And, uh, and again, this, this is particularly um, this is relevant to, I mean, particularly relevant to mirror symmetry. Okay. So what I want to do is I want to start by observing that the group ring so the group ring of pi 1 of L is just the group ring of this abelian group is just the ring of Laurent polynomials in n variables. Okay, so for convenience, I will switch to complex coefficients, which is which makes life easy. Let's switch to complex coefficients. Even though really I should not switch to complex coefficients, I should switch to uh, maybe let me switch to a uh, Novikov field. But you should imagine that it's C, and I will write K for it. I'll write K for it. So we have K, Z, 1 plus or minus. And, uh, and now, now I said this is relevant to mirror symmetry, because this object, this is the ring of functions. In fact, the ring of algebraic functions on um, K star to the n. So K star is K minus. So if you analytically, if you want to think k star is like k minus 0, this is acceptable for us. OK, so there is a small lie ahead, which is this is actually the ring of algebraic functions 
And uh, when you do FLIR theory, you actually, we will, you actually need to work with the Ringo analytic functions. So, so if, to make the, what I will say, below precise, to make the rest of the talk precise. You need to replace uh, algebraic by analytic. But I, I don't, that would, that would take me, I would have to talk about you know, analytic geometry over the Novikov ring, and I really don't want to do that. OK. So this is a situation where we basically have complete understanding of what this uh, Hochschild cohomology or what this homology of the loop space is. So first thing is that um, something called the Hochschild Kostin Rosenberg theorem Rosenberg gives a computation of um, this uh, Hochschild cohomology of this algebra. Let me just write Laurent polynomials in terms of what are called polyvector fields on uh, k star to the n. Now, in general, I would have to, this, this is some kind of sheaf. Polyvector uh, vector fields form a sheaf. Uh, the tangent space forms a sheaf, and polyvector fields uh, is like the exterior algebra of the tangent space. Uh, but this, you know, uh, we are on some affine situation, and moreover, the tangent space of this is trivial. So this is basically something of the form um, a Laurent polynomial tensor the exterior algebra on the tangent space of this space at one point. So let me let me just call this y. It's really much better if I just call this y at one ca at a canonical point, let's just pick a canon canonical point to be 1, 1, 1, 1. You know, k, we removed 0, so we shouldn't work. Tangent space of y at 1. Okay, that's really what it is. So now, you know, you, so okay, this is mostly an audience of symplectic geometry, so you're probably wondering, like, what, what does this have to do with what we were doing before? Well, The, the reason that this is useful to appeal to is that um, Kinsevich proved formality, proved the formality theorem, which basically says that the L infinity structure on um, this, I mean, in this, on this Hochschild cohomology, on the Hochschild cohomology of y has no higher order terms. The terms and can actually be identified with some explicit expression that you can just write down, you know, using linear algebra uh, on, on, on the polyvector field. So it matches up. I don't know what the classical name for it, uh, but I'm going to call it with the classical Lie bracket on polyvector fields. Uh, this is not true for all y's. I mean, well, anyway, it's true some kind of some affine case. Great. So this means, so now go back to symplectic geometry. So go back to our torus, the Grangian torus. So this um, <coughs> this deformation of uh, the homology of the base loop space of L can then be decomposed into into you know with respect to this decomposition of the exterior algebra. So first there is the zeroth order power of the exterior algebra which is just going to be um, a function. So this is function, which is this m0 that we were talking about. So this, it lives inside h0 of the loop space of the torus. But really, it's better to think about it as a function on the space. And then there is m2, 
which is, uh, well, now it's, it's some deformation of the product. But actually, if you think about it, well, so, but in this language, it lives in here. Uh, this, by duality, this gives rise to a Poisson structure. Gives you a Poisson structure. And then you can get a deformation of the product. And in general, it's a non-commutative deformation. And then M4 gives rise to, uh, sorry, maybe it would have been easier to do this. This is Maslow 2. This is Maslow 0. This is Maslow minus 2. Gives rise to M4, which is, um, which is just, you know, it doesn't change. It doesn't change anything you see on homology at naive level. It doesn't doesn't introduce a function. It doesn't change the product. This is some higher product. Okay. But the key thing that it gives you is that you can now think of m zero as this function. Okay. And now comes the the theorem. So. As, we, as I saw, as we saw before, so what I explained is when is the loop space unobstruct when is the base loop space when that is that when is that deformation unobstructed and that's wherever this function vanishes. But you can have situations where this function is non-zero, but you can still do some non-trivial theory. And you can ask yourself, what is the, you know, what can you, what can you optimally do given a given given a specific Lagrangian? So uh, there exists a non-trivial. I have to say this in terms of Fukai categories anyway. Object of the Fukai category of M, which is supported supported on L, if and only if the leading order term M0 which can be thought of as a function, has a critical point. OK? And then you can ask yourself, what? so let's say that it has a critical point. What should you do? What is the, what is the optimal thing you could do? Well, what you can do is you can take the critical locus. So, so in fact, this machinery tells us what kind of the best thing we could do. In fact, the best object to consider is the representation, is the local system on L, which corresponds to, well, I wasn't going to say kind of, to, which corresponds to the ideal, to, let me just say, K, Z, I, plus or minus, modulo some ideal. And this is the ideal defining the critical locus, which of course you can write down in terms of some Jacobian. Kind of Jacobian. This is some kind of Jacobian, right? OK? So you know, the, the, so, so now, now comes the fact why it's useful. So on the one hand, you know, I could have just written down just some algebra. I could have said, consider you know, some Lagrangian torus and consider the corresponding element in M0. And then I would say, well, just write down some formula, OK? And take the representation of the group ring, which corresponds to that quotient of the group ring by that, uh, by, by, by that ideal. But it wouldn't have had any meaning. Okay. The meaning of that ideal is that under, you know, if you try to think geometrically about Laurent polynomials as the ring of functions on, on this uh, on this space y. This ideal is actually the ideal of the critical um, of the uh, critical locus of the function. Okay. So the fact, the statement that this is somehow the best object is something along the lines of: if you take any other uh, any other local system supported on L, um, then that object that local system is non-trivial if and only if it has non-zero harms with with this one. So this one detects it. Yes. You're saying basically that if, that you, if you are in the critical uh, on the critical locus, then the floor homology is not, is, is not zero. 
Yeah, in fact, this, this if the, yeah, yes, exactly. But some, so th this is the, some statement about if, you, if all you're interested in is non-displaceability, yeah. Yeah, you write, you, if, you can, if you can just figure out how to count the Maslow two disks passing through one point, which is not always trivial, if you could just do that, then you count them, you see whether there's a, fun, there's a critical point, and you're done. So Yes. So the, the, the yeah, exactly. So, and, and the reason that it's and in fact you can see that the, the fact that this is subtle because in the monotone case you don't have this muscle of zero and minus two and minus four. Okay. But the statement of formality basically tells you that you know th that tells you that the deformation theory just separates out and this kind of is the first thing you encounter. So. Uh, okay. So I don't have I have five minutes. So. Um, there is there's somehow I owe you a couple of things. One thing I owe is at least some explanation. At the beginning, I said one of the issues is that um, is that we you know we don't know how things behave in families. It is, it's hard to figure out how things behave in families, and this this gives you an explanation for how things behave in families. Um, so so maybe all I can say is that so usually uh, one considers uh, Fleur theory. For tori, tori equipped with rank one local systems. And this is actually a model. This gives a gives a model for uh, Fleur theory for this. I said something about non-Hamiltonian Fleur theory for. Uh, the tori obtained by uh, non-Hamiltonian isotopies, obtained uh, by uh, non-Hamiltonian isotopies. Okay, and when one considers this, one obtains one. You get one group, one Fleur homology group for each for each uh, local system, which means for each point uh, z in k star to the n. Okay, that's each each one of these is stating, stating the monodromy, giving you the monodromy on one direction of the torus. But the point of family Fleur homology, which is uh, which is uh, you know, not an easy thing to do, is to try to understand kind of how do these families behave behave um, as you well anyway behave as you vary z. But in fact, you know, uh, you know, kind of the the construction using based loops. Omega L recovers all of these at once. Let me call this B, these at once, by just specializing, by setting uh, B equals Z in the formulas above. And so for example, if you are looking so if, if you want to go back to the classical story and would like to know which Lagrangians have a Lagrangian Torah, which local systems have a chance of not being non -zero, having non-zero Fleur homology, they are exactly the ones which lie in the critical locus. Okay? But actually, if you're in the non-commutative deformation case, or somehow if you have in the non-monotone case, that is not enough because in general they will actually be they will actually be obstructed. Okay. And then the last thing I want to say is that uh, I believe that this is really just uh, the first approximation of the correct story. So, further prospects. So, the, what I did at some point is I used the fundamental clot, the some fundamental chain of the moduli space of disks inside the. Let me just say the chains on the freedom space. This is obtained by evaluation at the boundary. But there's actually something which lives over this, which I will call the disks um, of associated with the pair LM. So this is smooth maps, maps from um, D2 S1 to ML. And now, of course, you know, the moduli space is just included in here. 
So you don't even have to let me just do it here. This is just inclusion. And the problem, the, prob the long-lasting problem is somehow, OK, it lives in here. What are you going to do with it? OK? So maybe my point is follow is simply that uh, this is, in fact, an, an L infinity algebra. So this is new observation is that this, well, in fact, this space, well, no, let me just do the chains. Uh, the chains on PML is an L infinity algebra. And um, this M1 gives a solution to Mark Cartel in here. Gives a Mark Cartel solution in here, in, in, in this space. OK, well, so, so this is an L infinity, al L infinity algebra. So you should think it's associated to some deformation problem. OK? And what I will tell you is not the deformation problem that it's actually associated to, but a deformation problem that it maps to. Okay. The, the problem that it actually is associated to, I don't yet completely understand. Uh, it seems to be some, some kind of, um, it's somehow, somehow, it's like it's a deformation of an algebra as a module over something. So it's a bit, it's a bit delicate. Uh, but so what do I want to say? Yeah, so, so, the, so this gives rise, gives rise to a deformation problem. For um, so now for for the chains on some other space, which I will now, which is basically the based version of that. So these are maps from disks s one point to m l star. Okay, which is slightly strange, but I claim that this is also an a infinity an a infinity space or an h space, and just as my Last remark to anybody here who has ever taught algebraic topology, you in fact know that this is an H space. Because um, if you take pi 0 of this, this is pi 2 of m rel l. And one of the things that you teach in algebraic topology is that there is an exact sequence like this. Okay? And you teach that this is abelian, but this is not necessarily. OK? And the, the product structure on this is actually just the reflection at the, at the level of components of the product structure on this H space. So this, has, this is an A infinity algebra. And uh, the deformations of this A infinity algebra are not actually controlled by that, but that space, the free maps, but the free maps maps to the thing that control it. And so this class then gives you some deformation. And I think the main, one of the main questions, now I can't appeal to kind of conservative formality, but there's an important question which is kind of, what is the appropriate deformation theory taking place here? So what is the formal meaning of this deformation theory, this deformation problem? OK, I think, uh, I think uh, my time is up, so thank you very much.